Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, as Ben mentioned, my name is John Newman. I'm the lab director here at Physical Electronics. And uh, hopefully many of, of you are familiar with Physical Electronics, but we are the world's leading supplier of surface analysis equipment, techniques such as X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, Auger electron spectroscopy, and time of flight secondary ion mass spectrometry are three of our main techniques. One of our techniques uh, or instruments that we sell is called the Phi 710 Scanning Auger Nanoprobe. And uh, this particular picture, you don't get to really see the, the hardware inside the box. Uh, the box is an acoustic enclosure to keep out uh, acoustic noise, as well as to make sure that the temperature remains constant inside the chamber. Uh, that way we get the smallest possible beam size uh, in the instrument. Now it Obviously, by its name, it's primarily an OJ nanoprobe instrument, and I'll talk more about what OJ is all about shortly. Um, but it can also be used uh, by adding a variety of different options to the instrument, all in situ. Uh, it can be used for, for much more advanced materials characterization. Uh, besides the OJ and the secondary electron detector in the system, uh, other options that can be added include EDS, or Energy Dispersive X-ray Spectroscopy, Electron Backscatter Diffraction, or EBSD. You can add a in-situ focused ion beam, or FIB, and finally a Backscatter Electron Detector, or BSE. As an agenda today, I'd like to first introduce OJ Electron Spectroscopy uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with it and go through uh, uh, a few pages on that. And then some very brief introductions to the other options that you can add to the instrument. Finally, I'll, I'll have a few slides showing some applications where how do all these instruments or all these options fit together and how do they work in a complementary fashion. So Auger Electron Spectroscopy, or AES, uh, is also called either just Auger or sometimes SAM, S-A-M, as Scanning Auger Microscopy. And uh, OJ is an ultra-high vacuum technique, so pressure is less than 10 to the minus 9 torr inside the system. And it uses a finely focused field emission electron beam as the excitation source. And what we're monitoring in OJ are low energy electrons, typically less than 3 kV, as the analytical signal. The technique can detect all elements above helium. And it's an extremely surface sensitive technique, where we're looking at roughly the top 5 nanometers of the sample surface. The spatial resolution with the instrument for SEM imaging is 3 to 4 nanometers, and for OJ spectroscopy, about 8 nanometers. Uh, what is OJ used for? Well, primarily for determining the elemental, as well as, in some cases, the chemical composition of very small features, uh, 20 nanometers or so, in terms of the smallest it can look at, as well as for thin film analysis. Uh, the technique can also analyze insulating materials without conductive coatings uh, by using some low energy ion neutralization technique. Uh, you can also have a in situ inert gas sputter gun, such as an argon ion beam, and you can couple that with the Auger spectroscopy so you have the ability to either sputter clean samples to remove atmospheric contamination or handling contamination, or to obtain compositional or chemical depth profiles. Here's a schematic of what the excitation volume looks like for an electron, a high energy electron beam striking a sample surface. And you can see there's a whole variety of different um, electrons and x-rays that are emitted from the sample surface. What we're looking at are in, in the Auger process are electrons that are emitted from just the top few atomic layers of the, of the solid surface. That's because any Auger electrons that are emitted from below that outermost few layers wind up having inelastic collisions with other atoms in the, uh, in the sample and lose energy and just add to the background signal. So it's an extremely surface sensitive technique. We'll talk about this uh, whole excitation volume a little bit more in, when we talk about some of the other techniques. Uh, one page on the theory. On the left we see the, an orbital view of the electrons in an atom, and the electron beam causes the ejection of a core-level electron, in this case a, a K-level electron. 
and that vacancy is then filled by an upper level electron and that's an energy gain process. That energy gain then causes the emission of another electron, a third electron, and that's referred to as the Auger electron. We can measure the kinetic energy of that Auger electron and that tells us what element it is. Over on the right we see what the data actually looks like in the magenta line there on the bottom um, that's sort of the raw data that comes out and you can see these itty bitty little small peaks on top of a intense sloped background and you can expand those peaks out and look at them a little bit more closely but even then it's on this this huge slanting background so often in in Auger we wind up taking the first derivative of the signal and then you have a flat background on which you can get the the, the peaks very nicely showing up and for quantum quantitation purposes simply measure the peak-to-peak -peak, uh, intensity of those. So what types of data does Auger provide? Well of course it has a secondary electron detector in there so you can do secondary electron imaging and get uh, get very nice high mag photos of the area that you want. Um, you can also do elemental analysis taking survey spectra and from that you can determine what elements are present, again uh, everything from lithium on up, as well as their concentration. You can also do two-dimensional mapping uh, so you can see the elemental or the chemical distribution of elements on the sample surface. You can run it in a high energy resolution mode as well so that you can get chemical state analysis and not just elemental information uh, from some materials or some elements. Combining Auger with an inert gas ion beam, you can also do spotter depth profiling for thin film and interfacial composition analysis. Here's an example of data taken on an Auger instrument on the 710. You see an SEM image within the middle of it is this uh, kind of whispery, fibery uh, kind of material. And if we zoom into that a little bit more uh, with a, a 10 micron field of view, you can barely see the faint um, outline of that uh, whispery defect on there because it's so thin that the secondary electron imaging is looking right through it. But with the fine focusing of the Auger instrument, you can take a series of different points on and off of that defect and compare the data. And you can see in points one and two that are taken on the defect, you clearly see that copper is present along with carbon and oxygen. You can take data as well as on some of the metal traces, and that shows copper, oxygen, and carbon as well on there. And then you can take data on the background or the dark material, and you see it's simply silicon oxide. And so the flake here is, is clearly a copper uh, flake that had occurred uh, probably from the metallization process. You can obtain two-dimensional maps from this, this particular sample. On the left, we have an oxygen map and that is indicative of the silicon oxide on the sample surface and then on the right we have a copper map that clearly shows that the flake is made of copper as well as you can see the copper in the metal traces on the surface. You can do compositional depth profiling of the flake. Here we have intensity that can be converted to atomic concentration on the y-axis versus sputter depth and you can very nicely see that the copper is, is intense until you reach about a depth of maybe 45 nanometers at what point the copper drops off in intensity and you reach the silicon oxide below it. And so in this case the, the flake was determined to be about 45 nanometers thick. Besides get, getting just elemental information, Auger in some cases can also provide chemical state information. On the left you see two different uh, high resolution spectra for zinc oxide and for zinc metal and you can see that they have both different peak shapes as well as different peak energies and you can use those differences to mathematically separate out the chemistries uh, say in a map or in a depth profile and on the right you see a chemical state depth profile of zinc oxide on zinc metal and very easily uh, separate the two different chemical states for zinc. Here's a nice example of showing the spatial resolution of Auger on a feature that's a manganese sulfide inclusion in steel and uh, the width of the inclusion is only about 200 nanometers wide, so very small.
On the right, you see an overlay of, of several Auger maps uh, for things like manganese and, and copper that was found there, as well as the iron surrounding the, the, uh, the inclusion. And you can see some of the features in there are extremely small. And for example, you see the oxygen kind of surrounding the whole inclusion, and those are iron oxide uh, kind of precipitates. Uh, where corrosion has, is occurring around that inclusion. And those features are only a couple tens of nanometers wide, so very, very small features. So uh, obviously in an S in a uh, Auger instrument, we also have a scanning electron microscope in that we have an SED detector present. And these are used for obtaining the high resolution photos, for navigation on the, on the sample, as well as picking our points of analysis, similar to what you do on an SEM EDS. In this case, here's a, a SEM image of a nickel silicide inclusion on a nickel coating on silicon. Another option that is very common on SEM instruments is energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy, and this can also be added to the OJ instrument. And EDS uses the same electron source as the OJ does, high resolution uh, field emission source. And, uh, but now we're looking at the characteristic X-rays coming out of the sample as opposed to low energy electrons. The depth of analysis and the spatial resolution are on the order of half a micron to maybe three microns in, in depth and width, but that varies depending on the excitation voltage that's used. Uh, and EDS is used for determining elemental composition of smallish kind of features, uh, thin films, and bulk materials. Going back to the uh, sample interaction excitation volume diagram that we looked at earlier, we can see in the kind of bluish purple there what the excitation volume of the electron beam hitting the sample looks like. And this is the region where you can, can uh, generate x-rays and since X-rays uh, like to penetrate uh, quite deep into materials or exit uh, from quite uh, deep into from materials, uh, your depth of analysis is, is mi can be microns into the sample. So we're no longer a shallow type of analysis with EDS compared to OJ. EDS can detect, uh, similar to OJ, all elements uh, from lithium and above. The two techniques, OJ and EDS, are actually competing processes. On the left, you see the, the core level electron being ejected from the K orbital uh, and an upper level electron filling that vacancy, causing the ejection of a, a third electron or the OJ electron. On the right, you have the same process where the K level uh, electron is being ejected. An upper level electron fills that vacancy, but now instead of ejecting a third electron, it causes the emission of an X-ray, and that's the analytical species that we follow with, with EDS. You're looking at the characteristic X-rays. Uh, here's an example of a thin film coated uh, aluminum substrate, and the aluminum is known to have nickel sulfide uh, precipitates or particles in it. And if we look at the spectrum obtained from this, uh, this particular sample, and I think it's, yeah, it's a 100 micron field of view, you can see it's primarily aluminum from the substrate, but you also do see the the iron and silicon present from the nickel. I'm sorry, from the iron silicide uh, precipitates that are in the aluminum, and you can now map that uh, in a two-dimensional display and very nicely see both the iron and the silicon showing up from the iron silicide particles that are buried below that coating. You can then do other analyses once you know where they're. These uh, precipitates are located. You could do, say, OJ depth profiling, or you could fib one of the uh, one or more of the precipitates and and do either EDS or OJ on that fib cut. Uh, the next technique is is backscatter electron microscopy with a, or BSE, and this is a technique where you use again the same electron beam as the excitation source, but now we're looking at backscattered electrons as the analytical signal. And since higher Z elements or heavier elements backscatter more strongly, uh, these heavier elements are going to be brighter in the backscattered image than lighter elements. And so really backscattered images are providing Z contrast, which is kind of a relative compositional type of imaging. The backscatter detector that we use in the instrument has, has uh, four different detectors, 
and they can be operated in a mode where you can also get topographical images. And then you can compare the topographical images to the relative composition images and get some insight into topography versus uh, material properties. Here's an example of a backscattered image, uh, courtesy of Devon, which is the backscatter detector we use. And this is in a backscatter image of granite, and granite's a mixture of a variety of different minerals, uh, aluminum containing silicon, uh, alkalis, alkali earths, uh, and iron as well. And we have the heavier elements providing brighter images here, brighter features in the image, uh, and the lighter ones are going to be darker. So uh, in general, the brightest, one, brightest features there are probably the iron composition in the, in the granite. The next technique that you can add in situ is the electron backscatter diffraction, or EBSD. This is a technique that's been around for quite a while, but it used to be you'd have to run for oh, a day or more to get good signal, and now with improved detectors, within a couple hours you can get very nice data. EBSD is a microstructural crystallographic characterization technique, again using a highly focused electron beam as the excitation source, but now we're looking at backscattered and diffracted electrons as the analytical signal. The depth of analysis and the spatial resolution is a little bit higher than it is for Auger. Uh, it's on the order of tens of nanometers. And this technique is used to study crystalline or polycrystalline materials and help determine the, the phase identification or the crystal orientation, uh, grain size and shape, uh, strain, as well as grain boundary misorientations of materials. So very useful technique for materials characterization. And it's often combined with some type of compositional analysis like EDS or more recently Auger, as many compounds have identical crystal structures and so their diffraction patterns look the same. But you can use the elemental composition analysis by EDS or Auger to identify uh, what the material is. Conversely, you have materials that have identical compositions like quartz and glass, for example, that um, aren't going to be identified or separated by EDS or OJ, but they have different crystalline structures, and so you can identify them with EBSD. Here's a nice example of a welded copper alloy cross-section, and you can see on, on the right there, or in the middle, middle uh, image, we have a what's called an inverse pole figure. And that information, uh, or the pole figure, tells you what crystalline plane is facing up and it has a little diagram on the right there showing a color code for the different crystalline planes. And you can see from the image that the, the grain sizes are dramatically different throughout this area. Um, near the top we have quite large grains that are oh tens of microns in size and then as you go down uh, there's kind of an abrupt border there and you have much much smaller grains. You can also see that most of the the colored image is red, indicating it's a 001 crystalline face that's facing up, but there are some 111 uh, facets as well facing up. And depending on the crystal orientation and the, the grain size, that can dramatically affect the strength of the weld. And finally, uh, another technique that can be added to the OJ is a focused ion beam, or FIB. And this is the one option that does not use the electron beam that's on the instrument. It uses a highly high energy focused ion beam, typically gallium from a liquid metal ion gun. And again it's in situ uh, and it's used for site specific cross-sectioning of small features and thin films. Uh, that way you can expose buried layers and defects and other features so you can do subsequent analysis on that whether it be OJ or EDS or just SEM imaging. Here's a nice example of a, a defect that was found in a half micron thick tungsten silicide coated silicon wafer. And uh, you can see the defect there in the left image. And in the middle was the, the focused ion beam cross section of that. And then in the right, you, we did analysis on that cross section sample with OJ. And you can very clearly see that there's a copper contaminant that's present between the silicon substrate and the tungsten silicide coating. And this uh, copper, I'm sorry, the carbon contamination was only about a third of a micron thick. This is the FIB is especially useful having in situ when you have samples that are reactive to air and you have to make sure that they aren't exposed to air.
um, due to oxidation and contamination, uh, so you want to do the fib cut in situ. So now we'll look at some applications to kind of give you a feel for how all these different techniques fit together. Uh, obviously the uh, complementary nature of Auger and, and EDS is pretty obvious. Um, EDS provides bulk analysis where you're looking down a half a micron to a few microns, whereas Auger provides the real, real surface analysis that's needed for, for real thin films. Here's a, a real old example that uh, I like to use just because the pattern of the defect is so, so unique. It's a flowery type of defect. And on the left you see analysis using EDS on and off of the, de the flower defect. And uh, there might be a little higher carbon concentration in the, on the petal compared to the substrate, but it's not real obvious. Uh, whereas the Auger spectra in the upper right clearly show there's both fluorine contamination on the petal as well as a much higher carbon concentration. And then you can use that Auger data to nicely map out the defect and you see in the, in the lower images the carbon uh, or a, a, a composite map as well as the fluorine map in the right. Interestingly enough, there's a submicron aluminum particle that uh, seems to be present whenever these flowery type of defects were present. The next example is uh, back to manganese sulfide inclusions in carbon steel. And uh, these, that's a, two micron, a 0.2 micron marker there, so you can see these are small inclusions. On the left, you have the EDS analysis of the inclusion, and it's clear that it's, it contains manganese and sulfur in it. You also see iron, but it's not clear whether the iron is really in the inclusion or if it's just from the large excitation volume of EDS exciting the iron surrounding the manganese sulfide inclusion. On the right you have the Auger analysis and you see the same manganese, sulfur, and, and iron present, but now you also see a relatively large amount of copper that's present. And you can map those different elements uh, down below there. You see the color maps for the iron, manganese, sulfur, copper, and as well as silicon from a polishing particle. Um, but all of those different elements are present uh, in the inclusion. In fact, uh, even though the iron concentration is lower in the inclusion compared to surrounding, you can tell that there is some iron present in the inclusion as well, it, although it being lower than the outside. So here's a nice example of the EDS showing the bulk composition of the, the particle or the inclusion and the Auger showing some of the surface chemistry or surface elements that are present, like the copper, which did not show up in the EDS analysis. So obviously it's a real thin layer present there. Here's an example combining Auger, EDS, and EBSD on um, another manganese uh, sulfide inclusion in carbon steel. This particular one was along the, the rolling direction of the steel, and so you get this long, narrow inclusion that's present. And um, the EDS maps for manganese and sulfur are shown in the bottom middle, and they clearly show that the manganese and sulfur are, are um, just present within that inclusion itself. Interestingly enough, though, when you look at the Auger maps for sulfur and for manganese, you see that the manganese is present only in the inclusion, but the sulfur is now diffused out to react with the iron surrounding the, uh, surrounding the inclusion. You can nicely see that in the blue here. Interestingly enough, it also shows up in the SEM image. On the right, you have the EBSD maps uh, showing, giving information about the inclusion area. And you can look at the grain sizes as well as the inverse pole figure showing which crystalline orientations are facing up. And you see that there's, uh, there's some grains of 111, some 001, as well as the 101 grains all present. In, uh, more interestingly here, we have a strain field map that shows the strain around the inclusions, and that can provide information on where corrosion could potentially occur uh, were this sample exposed to corrosive materials. So a nice example of using three different techniques to characterize uh, this inclusion. Here's an example of a fib cross-section on a small defect. It's only about a micron size defect, and you have different uh, magnification SEM images from 10K up to about 40 kV in the, in the lower right here. And we picked two points to do EDS analysis on this, um, but due to the, uh, the excitation volume, large excitation volume of EDS, uh, 
There are differences in the relative amounts of silicon oxygen present in the, in the spectra, but uh, you don't see any other elements that are present there, and it's really too small to map since it's about a one micron feature. However, Auger, with the smaller analytical spot size, uh, you can clearly show that there's a lot of uh, structure to this uh, cross-section of the particle where you have a, your silicon substrate below with some oxide on the surface, and then you have a, the silicon oxide particle in red here surrounded by elemental silicon, and so you know that the, the polysilicon deposition occurred after the particle was introduced onto the sample surface. And then, in fact, you have tungsten deposited on top of that, and then finally more SiO2 surrounding all of that. Interestingly enough, the tungsten was not detected by the EDS just because it was just, just a, such a, a small volume of material. Now, if you did want to do EBS, EBSD on such a small area, really the, the EDS wouldn't have the spatial resolution to give you the compositional analysis that you need in the small areas. So only Auger would be able to provide the, the detailed compositional analysis of this to combine with the EBSD. So I hope this has given you a, a good flavor for what combining all these different options into the Auger nanoprobe uh, can do for advanced materials characterization. Uh, besides the Auger and the SEM in the instrument, you can add in situ EDS for looking more at a bulk type of composition. You can add EBSD for looking at crystallographic information and strain and grain size and things like that. You can add a in situ focused ion beam or FIB for cross-sectioning samples in situ. And again, this is real helpful for reactive materials that uh, you cannot expose to air. And finally, a backscatter detector for giving you relative compositional images uh, with, with Z contrast. There are a couple other options of, available as well in the 710. One is an in situ fracture or parking stage. And this is real nice for doing fractures of metallographic materials where there might be, say, embrittlement present uh, or you want to study the grain, the uh, segregation to grain boundaries where you can fract actually fracture the sample in situ using liquid nitrogen and then look at those grain surfaces. Another option we have available is a, either a vacuum or an inert gas transfer vessel used for transferring samples, say, from a glove box into the analytical chamber without exposing, exposing the sample to air. Uh, thank you very much.